Welcome to HortTube. My name is Jim Putnam. This is the Sunday garden question and answer video that I do uh, most Sundays. Um, I took a break from it for a month or two there, but I'm back uh, doing these uh, question and answer videos again. I put the first one up uh, last week. A lot of you uh, viewed that, and there were a lot of questions down at the bottom of it, something probably like 130, 140 questions. Obviously, I can't answer 130 or 140 questions in one of these videos, and so don't be disappointed if I didn't answer your question. Um, I do have a question and answer playlist on the channel. You can go back and uh, look at some of those if you're interested. Uh, and uh, I may have answered it in the past. Uh, I may do another one of these midweek just because there's so many, there were so many good questions uh, this time around. And so if you're interested in that, uh, comment with that down below. Uh, Holly is right behind me laying down. I think she's probably pouting a little bit because I'm not letting her wander around the, uh, run, wander around the garden while I, uh, while I record this. Um, drinking coffee this morning. I'm going to turn these a little more casual. I tend to stand up over there and, uh, and talk with my hands like I always do, but um, I got my coffee this morning. I go to um, an independent coffee shop called Cup of Joe right down here on Hillsborough Street. It's about three blocks away. Uh, I was down in Charleston earlier this week, and my uh, favorite independent coffee shop in Charleston is called Kudu, uh, K-U-D-U. Uh, also down below this video, ask your gardening questions and tell me what's your favorite independent coffee shop is. I think it's important as these small businesses are opening back up and uh, getting their lives back together that we um, that we uh, give some love to them. Uh, and uh, so I may on these uh, Sunday question and answer videos just ask this question about what your next week I'm going to do favorite independent garden center. So prepare that one in your mind between now and then. Okay, let's get started on questions from uh, last week. Uh, somebody asked me um, about plants for a north facing wall. Uh, that um, I'm assuming they didn't say where they were, but here in the south, the sun actually passes us to the north uh, during the uh, during the summertime. So uh, this over here is south for me, and uh, in the winter time, the sun obviously is tracking to the south, like it is for everybody uh, in the U.S. Uh, in the summertime, though, here in North Carolina, the sun is actually passing to the north of me uh, on this side. And if you if you have a foundation that one, the long direction faces that north side and you're in the south, it's a difficult place to grow plants because for about three months out of the year, maybe two and a half months out of the year, it cooks. And I mean absolutely cooks almost all day long. And then for nine months out of the year, it's shade. And I mean not one ounce of sun uh, as you would expect on the north side uh, of a foundation. So it can be difficult in the south. I've, I've answered this question way, way, way back in the past, but I thought I'd answer it again. Uh, I lean on native plants in very difficult situations. And so for me, um, things like clethora um, would work here uh, in, the, in the south. Uh, beautyberries, inkberry hollies. Um, uh, let me think about what else. Um, uh, dwarf yopon hollies or just regular yopon hollies. Any kind of native plants tend to be more adaptable. Even red buds are very adaptable to just a few weeks of direct sun and the rest of the year uh, being in the shade. So um, uh, that's what I look to. When, if I'm dealing with a difficult space, if space that's too wet, space that's too dry, space that's too sunny, space that's too just difficult, I, that's when I lean on native plants. I have more Asian plants than I have a lot of Asian plants in this yard, but I do have a lot of natives blended in. And if you'll watch these tour videos I'm doing right now, I do have a lot of native plants. Uh, and, but I don't have a lot of difficult spaces uh, in, this, in this landscape. I did on the old house though, I had a north facing wall. My back deck on my house in the summertime was virtually unusable. Uh, it was so hot. Uh, so I am familiar with that problem. Uh, lean on native plants. Um, I'm sure a garden center in your area can help you out with that. Uh, somebody was asking about a tree on the west side of their house. They had um, taken out a maple and uh, um, needed something to, uh, to replace it with. I think they said it's a two-story house, so it's got to be a shade tree that gets quite big. When we're putting a tree on the west side of a house, we're not going to use an evergreen tree because in the wintertime, we'd like for those leaves to drop off and collect some of the sun's energy, you know, so we're not... Um, you know, heating the house while we shade it with a, you know, shade it with a magnolia or something like that. Obviously a magnolia would make a great tree in this situation, but, uh, or an evergreen magnolia, but um, we'd rather have something that loses its leaves in this situation. It's kind of funny because I Googled this just to see what people would say on Google and everything, it always comes up, people want to recommend red maples, red maples, red maples, which this person already took out, which I just took out in this front 
garden space. There's a sick one in the neighbor's yard right beside me. Um, uh, red maples, and I've said this over and over, do not do well in urban spaces. They don't, and I, I, I realize they're beautiful. I realize there's a ton of breeding in them. They've got incredible fall color, incredible shapes. Um, they look great in nursery pots, and then after about five or six or eight years in the ground, they look terrible. I don't know why landscape architects put them in the street plantings in Raleigh. And I'm like, five years from now, they're going to fall apart. And that's exactly what they do over and over and over again. So, um, uh, again, if you're on small lot space, red maple is not for you. I would go to an oak, uh, and uh, there's lots of, uh, uh, lots of oaks that you can use. You can use a white oak. Uh, let's see, a scarlet oak. Um, is one of my favorites. I don't like red oaks particularly. I know during Hurricane Fran, we lost a lot of red oaks in the city of Raleigh. And so just remembering back to that, I remember them kind of being sensitive to wind loads, you know, and thinking forward in the future, if you did get a hurricane, um, you know, you want something that's still standing afterwards. And willow oaks, I had two giant willow oaks at the old house that I absolutely loved. Uh, so there's some, you know, a couple options for you. If it was a smaller house, you could use something like an Oklahoma redbud. Oklahoma redbud has um, Canadensis, which is the eastern redbud, and uh, Texas uh, redbud um, in the mix. And it's uh, very heat tolerant and uh, sun tolerant. Um, I've, got, I've got a hummingbird that taunts me out here while I shoot these videos on Sunday. I can't take a photo of it all week long. And now it's out here. It's on the dahlia. It's on the salvia. It, just, it, it literally sits here and taunts me. Um, I will get a photo of this hummingbird. Okay, um, somebody said their Cupertino nine bark uh, is getting powdery mildew all the time. And nine barks are susceptible to um, powdery mildew. A lot of breeding work going into nine barks to try to get um, powdery mildew resistance. Uh, those things need to really dry out in the morning sun. Uh, there's a lot of plants like that. Really, um, um, big leaf hydrangeas really need to dry out very quickly in the morning sun if they, the dew stays on them for long periods of time. You know they can get lots of foliar problems uh, as well. So there's a lot of plants that need morning sun. So that's my always my first question. There is no solution. I, there is nothing you can spray on that plant. And this is true for almost everything, by the way. Like every question I get about a disease or insect or whatever, what can I do about it? The answer is nothing. I mean, if you if you if you fall into the pattern of spraying something then you're now in the pattern of spraying something. And that, that's no answer. There's, there's, no, there's no actual answer to it. Um, the plant needs to be moved to a space where it dries out quicker in the morning. If that particular variety is more susceptible to powdery mildew, I actually don't know. I just don't have a lot of um, physocarpus experience. We're in the, here in Raleigh, we do have some nine barks here and there, but there's not a lot of them. We're kind of in the heat, you know, the heat kind of does a number on those in the summertime here. Um, but I would try to get it, try to get your nine barks to a place where they dry out in the morning. And uh, uh, unfortunately, I don't have an answer for you. I mean, there's 50 formulas for spraying for powdery mildew online. None of them is a cure because it's just coming right back. Uh, move, move the plant, um, move it or dispose of it if it's not making you happy. Uh, not a question, not an answer somebody wanted. Okay. Um, somebody asked me about plants that were burned in the Pacific Northwest during that heat um last week and i think some of it's still ongoing i think it's still super hot uh super hot out there whether any of that could have been prevented and the answer is probably no without a shade cloth like a shade cloth would have been helpful but i don't think anybody has a you know a quarter acre shade cloth they can put over their garden uh during those types of events but yes a shade cloth would have worked and what this is the damage that you're seeing from a heat wave like that is uh water is evaporating out of the leaves of your plants faster than the roots can put them up there. So there's no amount of water uh, that could be in the soil that would prepare a plant for that. It doesn't have a root system adequate to pull water up to the top of the plant. It's got a root system that's just kind of adequate for the normal conditions. Uh, but then when you ask it to put maybe double the amount of water uh, up into the top of the plant to prevent itself from being scorched, uh, in that kind of heat, it's not possible. So the only thing you could have done is cover them with a shade cloth. If there's something in particular that you saw burned, make a mental note or write it down. And so in the future, if you get another round of 110 or 115 degree temperatures, you know what you might want to cover. You can order shade cloths from Amazon. The 50, I get a 50% shade cloth that's, you know, good sized and, um, and, uh, and have it ready for some things that burned. 
most of that stuff's just going to come right back out of it. It's probably uh, ultimately not that big of a deal. Unfortunately, I know your garden's probably going to look a little rough this summer. Uh, but I think that's the answer to that. Um, let's see. Um, people like to talk about my crazy hands. I guess I'm holding this right here so that I, that I don't do this. Yes, I have definitely have uh, AD, ADD or ADHD. Um, uh, every report card I ever got in elementary school says very smart, but, <laughs> but ill-behaved. And, uh, and uh, that's continued through my... Uh, uh, into my adult life. I can get a lot of things done. I can do a lot of things. It's how I had a nursery and three retail locations and how I can landscape, you know, a property uh, very, very quickly uh, and answer lots of questions and do lots of things uh, at the same time. But it does make me a little bit, uh, a little bit of a spaz and it's probably a turn off to some folks. Okay. Um, let's see. Somebody asked for a ground cover on a slope uh, there in, um, uh, zone five and it's full sun what's interesting about ground covers is that most ground cover plants most plants that adapted to be on the ground level adapted to that in the shade and so you know if you ask me a shade ground cover plant there's well there's you know that's 90 percent of all the ground covers when you take out the, out the full sun uh, there's not a heck of a lot of options especially on a dry a drier slope the reason for that's obvious if something's out in the full sun it would have tried to race everything else to stay in the sun you know, everything's kind of vertical if it's out in the sun. The things that evolved in the forest floor, you know, are just trying to cover as much of the ground space as they can. Um, there's that hummingbird again. <laughs> okay, I will, I will take a photo of them. Okay, but, um, you know, if you've got full sun um, conditions on a slope, zone five, you definitely can use junipers, uh, you know, obviously. Uh, and they're going to be deer resistant. Uh, I would consider using some perennials and using things like cat mint, uh, some lower growing salvias. Um, y there's lots of perennial things that you could put uh, on the slope. Uh, herbs are another great choice that the deer and the rabbits typically won't eat. So things like a ground cover thyme, great choice. And it, and it grows, and it, you know, le things like lemon thyme grow very quickly. I've got one, it's a foot and a half wide over there. It'll be in a video in a couple of days on the garden update, oregano. Uh, sages, um, lots of uh, ground cover choices um, uh, that you could use that would be hardy. Uh, you can't use rosemary up there, it's not cold hardy enough, but uh, the, the other things there. The other things there are, okay, uh, let's see. Um, and mix it up, you know, don't use the entire, don't plant the entire bank with the same, with the same exact plants all the way across the entire bank because that's, uh, you're inviting some sort of disease or insect problem to uh, eliminate your entire space. So don't try to solve this with one plant. If you try to solve those things with one plant, in 10 years you'll be asking yourself why you try to solve it with one plant because if you've got spider mites or you got root rot or you got whatever, um, you know, happening to those plants, uh, they're all, you're gonna lose them all at the same time. Mm. I get lots of questions on the channels about uh, making hydrangeas bluer. And you know we can use a soil acidifier for this. Typically, uh, sulfur uh, or aluminum sulfate can be added. This person's added aluminum sulfate a few times, and it hasn't made any any difference. I wonder if when it was planted, it was planted, it was babied too much, so the plant's not in actual contact with the soil. Uh, and uh, um, we had this problem in the uh, nursery. We had this problem in the nursery business. They almost always bloom pink in a container uh, without some. Uh, additional, uh, you know, without aluminum sulfate uh, being added uh, to the mix. The, um, uh, the soilless media uh, doesn't allow, um, doesn't give us the blue flowers that we'd like. So if you, if you plant a hydrangea macrophylla and you put tons of organic material in it, and you're just loving it and love, oh, this plant's gonna grow great. If the plant's gonna grow great, but you may end up with pink flowers because it's just not in contact with the soil, um, you know, where those, uh, where those nutrients are that it needs uh, to, uh, you know, to create that to create that color that you're looking for. So don't baby them too much, um, too, too much, you know, I don't know if that's the problem, but it could be. Okay, um, this may be the best gardening question I've ever gotten. Um, and uh, the question is how to restart the soil quickly after new construction. So somebody's moving into a new house um, and we all know what new construction uh, landscaping uh, looks like, <laughs> and, you know, where the stripping off of the topsoil to put it out on the front of the subdivision to create a, you know, a wall of, you know, whatever they're going to grow on top of it. They're going to have to irrigate forever because it's six foot above the other, the other soil, but I, I won't 
we won't we won't vent about that this morning uh, uh, this is the best question I've ever gotten and it's what I have accomplished here in the last 18 months is waking the soil back up and the first thing I did was I decided where the bed spaces were going to go and I got the ground covered quickly and so I covered the ground here with compost and then I got some free wood chips and I put wood chips on top of that then I made my planting decisions uh, over the last year since I accomplished that. And so getting the soil covered as quick as possible is the way to bring it back to life. Uh, this is the most uncomplicated thing um, on the planet. Um, as humans turn the world into a de turn the land in the world into a desert on a near daily basis by uncovering the soil, uh, nature tells us that it wants the soil covered. Uh, you want life, you keep the soil covered. Fungi and bacteria, they are what feed our plants. They are what take care of our plants and make nutrients available. All you gotta do is cover the soil and they come back. And so that's what I did here. I'm going to turn this channel next year um, into what I call a closed loop landscape. And that means I'm not going to buy any fertilizer. I'm not going to buy any mulch. I'm not going to add anything to this yard that I'm not creating from this yard. And so I want to show you guys that next year I can have this exact same landscape without bringing anything in, else into it uh, because I've created what I would call a closed loop system. Uh, the plants, I didn't, the first 18 months, two years, I can't do this because I don't have enough material to dispose of and cut back and create my mulch and create my compost. Uh, I finally now have enough biomass on this lot then I can start doing this and start showing you this. You don't really need uh, to bring anything else in once you reach a certain amount of biomass that you have to have. And so um, I have initially brought in compost and I initially brought in wood chips. Since then I've used a more decorative uh, uh, triple shredded hardwood on everything. But I do wanna show you that next year that I'm not going to bring anything into this uh, landscape from the outside and I can do this exact same thing uh, that I've done this year. And I'm going to buy seeds and that kind of thing. I'm just talking about in terms of mulch and fertilizer and that kind of thing. You don't need it. Um, if you get the ground covered, if you get life coming back, um, it will all take care of itself. So again, that's the reason I consider that the best. That hummingbird just taunts me. Um, the best gardening question ever, because the answer to gardening is cover the soil. Uh, the answer to farming is cover the soil. The answer to um, any kind of restoration um, of the land anywhere on this planet is cover the soil <laughs> and, and it all and then it takes care of itself um, okay uh, a couple uh, just one more question um, let me see uh, two I'll, I'll, two more questions here and then again if you guys want me to do another one of these during the week I will I had a lot of other of, a lot of other questions that were probably great I honestly didn't even read all the way through them I apologize for that there were so many so much participation and I really appreciate it uh, somebody asked me about planting over a septic tank. Um, I planted over my septic field in the old house, but I only used annuals. And I told somebody this in a consultation uh, the other day. Only use annuals over your uh, septic field. Uh, you know, if you, I don't want you to, you don't, don't plant a tree on top of your septic field. Obviously, that's going to eventually cause you a problem, especially a maple or like a weeping willow. Cherries are really bad for it, too. Um, uh, but you plant annuals, and annuals can be your vegetable garden, annuals could be your, you know, color, you know, your color garden, a pollinator garden, throw, um, you know, seeds out on it, whatever you want to do, grow sunflowers on it, doesn't matter, just grow annuals so you're tearing them out uh, every season, uh, that's the only thing that I would put on top of it, I wouldn't really trust anybody else's, uh, you know, opinion on that, I mean, plants don't stop growing, you know, even, even kind of tameish things, um, you know, plants will continue to grow and they're, you know, uh, they want what that, what, what's down there in your uh, septic field <laughs> for sure. It's good stuff down there, good stuff down there for plants. And, uh, but annuals, annuals over the top of it works great. I put my vegetable garden right on top of it. Okay. Um, the last one I'll answer this week, somebody had bought a sunshine daydream abelia. It's a variegated abelia. I've got, um, what do I have here? I got radiance abelia here. I've got sunshine abelia in the uh, no i got miss lemon in the front yard and uh <laughs> miss lemon and radiance okay and they have sunshine daydream well that's too many too many names of of plants but it's, it's another variegated abelia it's wilting every afternoon and um 
uh, they're having to water it every afternoon, wanted to know if it would work out eventually. Uh, I, I think any plant that's wilting like this, I've talked about this a million times, go do a little bit of trimming on it. Uh, it will use far less water if it's not growing and trying to flower this first season. You really do that plant a huge service by stopping that afternoon wilt because I'm going to tell you what's going to happen is that plant's going to wilt and wilt and wilt and you're going to get into the pattern of having to water it and water it and water it. Then it's going to stop asking for water as the season slows down or as it thins out a little bit um, and you're going to continue to water it, water it, water it and then you're going to end up ultimately drowning it. Um, that's what I see very, very frequently on plants that wilt over and over and over again is the ultimate end to that is that you end up drowning them. Uh, and uh, because the plant just goes into a stress uh, and it's no longer using the water and you continue to water it. That's how that actually happens. Give it a little bit of a trim and it doesn't take anything, like an inch off of each branch and that plant will uh, stop doing that afternoon wilt uh, every single day. Um, thank you guys again for watching the videos and uh, following along with the channel and uh, asking questions on these Q&As. Again, I apologize for not getting uh, to uh, to everyone. Oh, somebody else asked about they couldn't find the propagation playlist on the channel. I'll link that up here uh, in the corner uh, right here at the uh, end of the video. Uh, again, like I say, thanks for asking. Uh, thanks for asking the questions, participating. Put your favorite uh, independent coffee shop uh, down at the bottom of the video and ask a garden question. Thanks for watching.